So now on to our, our second um, Restless Presents, and this is an introduction to Birds of the UK. I'm delighted to introduce you to Restless member Marina Harkins. Marina has spent many years owning and caring for all types of birds and has amassed a wealth of knowledge. After spending just minutes talking to Marina, her passion for birds was infectious. Uh, so without further ado, uh, over to Marina for her presentation. Hi, thank you. Well, hello everybody. Um, I can't believe there's so many people that have um, taken up the interest in birds and I'm delighted that um, there are so many of you that are interested in something that I've been passionate about for and continue to be passionate about for years. As Sarah already said, I've been a teacher for 20 plus years in the animal management with a wide range of um, animal related subjects from animal behaviour to animal training to wildlife conservation ecology but my passion is and always has been um, on birds so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight if we had about four months I could still continue to talk about this so I'm going to try in as much as I can in this short session so it's really designed as a useful grounding to the study of birds in general and to impart knowledge concerning birds, which will hopefully encourage you to think beyond the obvious and provide a foundation for further study. So I'm hoping I'm going to make some converts out of everybody um, in terms of birds. But as we go through the slides, I will not be reading them word for word. Um, I'll be uh, allowing you to read the slides and I'll just be talking over them. If I'm going too fast or you need me to slow down, if you just let Sarah get on, no, oh no, and then I'll slow down a bit or just put in the chat, Marina, can you slow down? Okay, you might be just behind me. I've got my little friend here. That's Bella. Not a bird, a cat. Um, so anybody basically can study birds from simply watching them in our gardens to university scientists and the more we learn the more fascinating they become. Um, so again as I said through your course I hope to take you through the world of birds from their beginnings with small competitors surrounded by dinosaurs to their divergence to nearly 10,000 different species living in a wide range of habitats, exhibiting diverse plumages and lifestyles, their amazing adaptations, fascinating courtship and mating behaviour, and of course, their incredible beauty. Uh, you'll see here the original um, uh, fossil found was called Archaeopteryx lithographica um, and it's actually around 147 million years old. Anybody who's a David Attenborough fan would have seen him talk about Archaeopteryx in many of his uh, wildlife programs but the skeleton actually shows several features which are intermediate between reptiles and birds suggesting that Archaeopteryx and the other birds define the dinosaur. So anybody who's seen um, Jurassic Park, if you think Velociraptor, uh, that's how they, they think birds actually um, started to evolve. So I don't know if you can see it very well, but if you look at the, the uh, picture on the bottom left, you'll see that the beak, you can just about make out that beak, but actually that had teeth. Whereas the wings have feathers. And again, so that suggests that actually all, all um, birds have actually evolved from reptiles or vice versa. So what is a bird? It's pretty typical. They all lay eggs and care for their young, have strong hollow bones, lightweight skeleton, um, a stiff beak adapted for um, 
sorry, I'm just going to stop you from my screen. It keeps coming up saying I've got bad connection. Give us a second. That's Marina, better. It's, we're just struggling um, to hear you a little bit. Feet. If you could um, get exactly. closer to the mic or speak up a little bit, that would be great. Sorry. Yep. 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 Can you hear me a bit better now? Is that any better, Sarah? That's better for me. I'll just wait for some of the other um, participants. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. That's 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 better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'll try and speak up a bit. Yeah. So um, where were we? Yeah. So they have a stiff beak adapted for their eating habits. Have feathers, wings, and most of them can fly. They're warm-blooded vertebrates. They all have four-chambered hearts. A high metabolic rate. And of course, they have, <coughs> excuse me, two legs. The main difference with birds is their behavior. Everything else about them is the same. So what makes them the different species is the actual way that they behave. And birds have a unique communication system, courtship behavior, community cooperation, chick parent recognition, and territorial defense. There's actually 29 order of birds. There's actually some disagreement between authorities over the total number of bird orders. Some actually state there's 23, some say there's 26, but 29 is the one that is recognized by ETO, which is the British Trust for Ornithology. And if you're interested in learning more about BTO, I put a slide right at the end of this PowerPoint which will give you details and a link of how to get on the TO website. Um, so out of the 29 order of birds, um, there's about 10,000 species which have been uh, divided into these 29 orders. And one of them, which is the largest of the family, is called the passiforms or perching birds. And they contain the most number of bird species of about 5,000 species. And although birds have many similarities, each individual also have characteristics, characteristics that make it totally unique. So this is where we come to an activity. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, there's four um, images of birds. So you can either write it down or you can put it in the chat and you can award yourself one for everyone you get right. So following each slide, I will give you the answers to the birds, but we'll give you a couple of seconds just to recognize them first. I won't be talking about all of them individually because we would be here all night. So. Um, here's the first slide. Let's just see how you. <clears throat> and to give you a clue, they are all British species. They can all be found in the UK. So, Sarah, I don't know whether some of them are writing in chat, or you can just write it down using your pencil and a bit of paper, because I will be going through the answers. We've got some coming through on the chat, Marina. Okay. Um, and there's just an ask right. if, if you could just be a little bit louder. Is that all right? Sorry. <laughs> yep, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be shouting at the screen soon. <laughs> yep. Shout out. Yeah. Do you want to give me some of the answers? Are you able to give the answers or should we just go on to the answers for now? Some of the things that are coming through, uh, Marina, are uh, crossbill, crossbill, blue tit, chaffinch, bullfinch. Um, yep, those are the ones that are coming through. All correct. Absolutely. All four of them were bang on. So well done those that identified those. And yes, and you're right. It's the crossbill, the blue tit, the chaffinch and the bullfinch. I'll talk a little bit about, let's talk about the crossbill. So the crossbill is used to extract seeds from conifer cones. They're most often encouraged 
um, sorry, encountered in noisy family groups or large flocks, <coughs> usually flying close to treetop height, seeds acrobatically fluttering from cone to cone. So that's why their bill is actually crossed to allow them to actually um, pull it, the pine cones apart to get the seeds out of it. So the adult males are a distinctive brick red and females are greenish brown. And they are what and they are listed on what's called the schedule one species. Now schedule one species birds are protected by law. So they're protected in um, their nesting, their breeding, their eggs and their young are all absolutely um, uh, protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981. And in England and Scotland, you need permits to actually ring these birds and record them. And the BTO do a lot of that work. So, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the chaffinch. The chaffinch is one of the most widespread and abundant birds in Britain and Ireland. It does, uh, doesn't generally feed openly on bird feeders. It actually prefers to hop about under the bird table or under the hedge. So you're usually hear a chaffinch before you actually see them because they've got a beautiful, loud song with varied calls. So um, we'll, we'll carry on so we don't run out of time. Um, and I'm happy for Sarah or Gaetano to actually send this PowerPoint on to you if anybody would like it. So there's the next four, see how you do. Anything coming through? Oh, we've got some coming through now. Yeah. Kestrel, curlew. Uh, yeah, the cur. Um, no, they. they ha no, sorry, they haven't got either of them yet. No. Starling, oyster catcher. We've got the starling and the oyster catcher is correct. Yeah, well, that that's the bottom two, but the top two. Now you'd be forgiven for that first one on the top left hand corner, because actually, although it looks like a peregrine falcon, it's actually a cuckoo. Uh, we had just had that come through. A right, <laughs> yes. They can actually be um, um, confused with the peregrine falcon because of their colouring and the way that they fly. Yeah, the second one is an abo set, which was close to curlew. Um, the next one was starling, and the next one is the oyster catcher. And there you go. So as you can see, just from these slides, I've given you an idea of how big they are, what they eat, and um, how many we have in, in, in Britain and how many are migratory. So if we talk about the cuckoo, the cuckoo are actually summer visitors and they're well known for what's called their brood parasitism. And that's where the female lays their eggs in the nest of other birds, especially meadow pipits. Dunnocks and reed warblers. Now, if you could see the difference between a reed warbler, which is a tiny little thing, what they will do is the cuckoo will um, push the eggs of the reed warbler out of their tiny little nest, lay their own egg in that nest. When that egg hatches, it actually outgrows the nest. I suggest you go on, have a look at cuckoo brood parasite and watch the David Attenborough um, on YouTube. It is absolutely fascinating. Um, so, and they are, the cuckoo is what's on called a, a red list species. And the red list species is a species that is listed on the International Union Conservation of Nature, which is the IUCN red list of threatened species. Um, let's talk about the oyster catcher. 
unlike their name suggests, oyster catchers actually seldom eat oysters, would you believe? Mostly they will eat mussels and cockles on the coast. Uh, most UK birds spend winter on the coast where they're joined on the eastern coast by birds from uh, Norway, from Norway. And um, I know I was only going to do a couple, but it's worth mentioning the starling. Some of you may have been lucky enough to have seen what's called a starling murmuration, which is where starlings gather in the evenings to roost. And they will participate in what's called a murmuration, in which they form a huge flock that shape shifts in the sky as if it was one swirling black liquid mass. Again, go on to YouTube, look at Starling Murmuration, or if you live by the coast, go down to the coast, especially in places like the Brighton Pier, go and watch them in the um, coming into roost in the evening. And then you'd have to get up quite early in the morning to see the murmuration in the morning, but it's absolutely fascinating. Next four. Are we doing well, there's stuff coming through, Marina. Um, green woodpecker, kestrel, swallow. Yep. Green woodpecker, kestrel, swallow are correct. So the top left we're looking at. Has anybody got that one? If not, uh -huh. I'll no. Right, that's the great crested grebe. That has come through. Yep. Uh, there you go. <laughs> oh, there's yeah, there you go. <laughs> Um, so there's a little bit about their diet and you know their wingspan and their weight. Um, if we talk about the great crested green, they are absolutely delightful, elegant water birds with ornate head hoop plumes, which led to it being hunted for its feathers and actually almost led to its extinct, extinction in the UK. They have the most wonderful, elaborate courtship in which they rise out of the water and shake their heads and it's all done in perfect unison with each other. Very young greaves often ride on the parents' backs. Again, have a look at YouTube and have a look at greaves with their babies. It is so cute. The babies climb onto the parent back and hide under their wings. So you, all you see is just this little baby's head poking out on the top of their mother's or father's back. Very cute. Um, I'm going to talk about the swallow. The swallows are absolutely amazing migrants. They can actually travel an average of an amazing 200 miles a day, meaning that it could take as little as 40 days to reach their winter destination in South Africa. They fly almost non-stop, and since they feed mostly on insects and flies, they're actually able to eat and um, sufficiently on the wing. They never come into land, they just do pure migration. Interesting thing about a swallow is their brains are designed where they can actually shut half of their brain off. They can sleep from half of their brain and the other half of their brain keeps them in their flight and feeds them. So how amazing is that? So we'll go on to the next four. Anything there, Sarah? Nope. Anyone, anyone brave enough to put some guesses out there? Oh, here we go. No, Pigeon. I can the answers if you like. Um, Pigeon, tree creeper. Tawny owl. Yep. Yep. Little owl. No. They've got tawny owl correct. You've got tawny owl correct. Got tree creeper correct. Got the wood pigeon correct. So the bottom left 
if I give you a clue, it's the fastest animal on earth. Falcon? No? Merlin? Okay, that is, it's the, it's the peregrine falcon. Oh, we did have that, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's the peregrine falcon, yeah. So the peregrine falcon is a large and powerful falcon and is the fastest animal on earth. And um, what they do is they, these birds spiral up so far into the sky that go into what's called a speck or to speck out. Then what they'll do is they'll turn around, pull in their wings, close their nostrils, bring their third eyelid over their eyes and go into a bullet stoop at, a hundred to, to, at a 200 miles plus per hour where they will hit their prey at speed. Now, the reason I put the pigeon next to it, because we very often underestimate the pigeon. A pigeon is the, mostly the prey of the peregrine falcon, although they will take other birds. But what happens is the peregrine falcon is coming down so fast, the pigeon is able to maneuver quickly. So therefore, eight times out of 10, that peregrine falcon will miss its kill because it's going so fast it waits and the pigeon will wait till it gets just close enough before it literally quickly maneuvers out the way and the peregrine falcon misses its kill. Um, peregrines were actually quite a low point in the 1960s due to human persecution and the impact of pesticides in the food chain. Um, Improved legislation and protection has helped the birds recover, and they've now expanded into many of our urban areas. So you can often see peregrine falcons nesting on tops of high buildings and places like London. I come from Guildford, um, and they actually nest on top of Guildford Cathedral, but you can also find nests in um, Woking, where um, they've actually got a um, a microscope set up there and actually um, look at the peregrines actually up in the sky hunting their their prey. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, and the wood pigeon, as I said, don't ever underestimate a wood pigeon. They are amazing flyers. Um, and next time you're out on your walk, watch them, watch their maneuverability. They are absolutely um, very, very clever. Um, I like pigeons until they land on my bird feeder and bend it and then it's not quite so nice. Next four. Are we all right for time, Sarah? Yeah, we're doing, we're doing well. Probably got another five, five, five-ish minutes. Good. And then and then Q and A. Yep, yep. Oh, we've got some yeah, um, fine. messages we'll coming through. Lackwim, Lackwing, um, Peewit, Red Kite. Yep. Hedge Sparrow, Crow Sparrow, Rook Sparrow, Kite, Rook, Eagle. Yeah. Lackwing, some called. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lackwing is correct. Sometimes called a Peewit. The red kite is correct, the with unmistakable fork tail. Whoever got rook, you are correct, and whoever got house sparrow, you are also correct. Um, let's talk about the red kite. These magnificent, graceful birds of prey are unmistakable with their reddish brown body, angled wings, and fork tail. It's actually saved from national extinction by one of the world's longest running protection programs. And red kites have been reintroduced to four areas since 1989. Um, and now they're really, really common. Um, and they can be seen on a daily basis in Southeast since their reintroduction. I'm sure most of you can see your special, you'd be able to spot a red kite on a daily basis now. They're also listed under Schedule 1 and protected under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Um, the rook um, 
The rooks are really small birds. You're not likely to see one on its own. They generally go around in pairs. Um, they will come together during the breeding season. Most of the corvids will like the crows and the magpies. But really once the breeding season is over, they will actually disperse and be quite lone, uh, loners as birds. They will often feed and roost in flocks in winter. Um, and you'll often see them to the birds like jackdaws. Next fall. I think this is the last fall for us. So we've, we've uh, got some coming through. Nuthatch, Robin. Correct. Osprey, yep. Kestrel, Sparrowhawk. Yep. Sparrow is correct. Yep. We've got some really good people out there who know their birds. <laughs> they are indeed the Nuthatch, the Robin, the Sparrowhawk, and the Osprey. Yeah. Um, now, the Osprey was actually known as the Fishhawk, um, and they live ex exclusively on fish that they catches by snatching them in the shallow dive from the surface of the water. Ospreys are amazing birds. Their their feet have little suckers on them. So when they catch their slippery fish, they'll dive into the water. And often the fish that they take can weigh twice as much as the bird itself. So the grip, so they grip it and this stick to the fish and then once they come out of the water, they will turn the fish round to face the way that the bird is flying to streamline the flight. Again, there's some really good YouTube clips on watching sprays um, uh, taking their prey from the water. And in fact, I have got a list of um, clips, um, YouTube clips um, that I can send across there if people would like, I've listed down loads and loads of different new clips on an able sheet of paper that people can go into and actually see them if, if they'd like them, I, I can email those across. Um, the uh, Sparrowhawk, these are your killing genes. Anybody who's got a bird feeder goes out in the morning and finds a load of feathers at the bottom of their bird feeder is almost certainly going to be a sparrow hawk kill. Um, the difference with these, with the sparrow hawk, at least with the peregrine falcon, when it catches its prey, it has the courtesy to kill its prey before it eats it. Whereas the sparrow hawk will actually kill the bird, will, will actually take the bird and start to eat while it's still alive. And they are the most magnificent hunters. Again, I've got a fantastic list of clips that you can watch on YouTube of a sparrow hawk and the way they can maneuver through by tucking in their wings. Um, they completely adapted for hunting in confined spaces like dense woodland. So gardens, <coughs> excuse me, are ideal hunting grounds for them. Um, and the nuthatch, little plump bird, about the size of the great tit, resembles a small woodpecker. Um, it's resident, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted this year. I, for the first time, I had my bird feeders. I, I'm actually getting quite a few nuthatch on my bird feeders, so I, I feel particularly blessed that these birds have come back. Um, they did. They weren't doing very well in terms of their numbers, but they've. Um, you can see they, the um, the UK breeding has gone up tremendously now. Um, so that are those are all the pictures of the birds, and well done to everybody because we got every got them all correct. BTO. Um, the British Trust for Ornithology, there's a couple of links there for anybody that might be interested. The BTO um, like um, people to have volunteer to carry out bird surveys 
a bit like the Big Garden Bird Watch, which is run by the BTO. And there's also another link there. I actually belong to the BTO. Um, and um, I also do volunteer surveying for their birds. And you can do it in your local area throughout the year. So please do took a look at the British Trust for Ornithology. Um, and they're the top people that actually track, keep track of all of the bird species within the UK. Um, so as I said, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a very short course, I know. Um, and I hope it has inspired some of you to study these wonderful, diverse and absolutely beautiful creatures. I could go on for hours talking about birds and in particular, birds of prey. So I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions, feel free to, let's hope I can answer them. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marina, for, the, for this excellent and interesting session on, on Birds of the UK. I, I'm sure um, the, the attendees will find it incredibly insightful. Um, and, and thanks to everyone that's sent their, um, that's joined this evening and that sent their, their questions. Um, there's a couple of questions to, to run through that I've noted here, um, Marina. If, if people want to ask more, please do so in the chat. It's worth noting um, there were some great conversations going on whilst you were talking. Shirley noted that the wood pigeon um, looked very slim in comparison to the ones in her garden. And uh, Susan suggested that maybe it had been to Slimming World. <laughs> so that's quite funny. Um, uh, one of <laughs> yeah, um, wood, pigeons are, wood pigeons are generalist feeders, basically. So the ones in your garden, I bet you've got a bird feeder. If you've got a bird feeder, it's fattening itself up. Yeah. So yeah, they 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 can get uh, that they, they they steal food from your bird feeders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, because they're just living the world. You never know. One of the questions we had was that um, somebody uh, two weeks ago saw uh, two Egyptian geese and uh, three. Um, geeslings, geese, geeslings. Uh, the next time they saw them, they saw uh, just Goslings, one, and the yeah. next time they saw none of them. So the question is, were were they born just too early in the year? Um, they can do. What can happen is Egyptian geese are migratory birds. Um, anybody who lives near Purbright in Surrey or, or has ever heard of Purbright in Surrey? Um, we get a lot of Egyptian geese and they come over here during the winter and they tend to have their babies here and um, and then they'll migrate back. So it, yes, it could possibly have been an, an early breeding, although it is quite early, but it does happen, particularly if we've had a mild winter. So um, yeah, but they are migratory birds. Um, they're not liked by quite a few farmers. What they do is they tend to eat their crops and they will tend to crop those fields down to pretty, pretty much not the same with Canada geese. Canada geese do the same thing. So yes, it could be early breeding, but um, it is a little bit early, yeah. Hope that answers the question. Another, another question that we had, and I think some of the other members also answered this, but wanted to put out there in case people missed it, was what's the main difference between swallows and swifts? Well, actually, they are completely different families, would you believe? They don't, they're not even related. The swallow um, has the fork, long forked tail and the swift doesn't. You off see them together and springs on the way. So around mid-March, you'll start seeing them all mi mi uh, migrating back. They're all in Africa at the moment and they'll be starting their migration back to this country and they come back to the UK to breed. And then they generally make start their long migration back to Africa around about end of August, middle of September but they're actually not related. Um, so, and the difference is the tail, although they do look very similar, the swallow um, 
is the one with the long forked tail. Thank you. Um, and I think this might be one of the last ones. This, there's some questions around uh, people are concerned about putting out some bird feeders due to cats. Is, is there anything people can do to protect birds um, from, from that? A really question. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I tend not to put out, I mean, I've got two cats and um, they, they've not, they're so used to seeing the birds out there, they don't tend to bother about them. But um, I tend to leave the fat balls, I, I don't put the fat balls out because um, what happens is the cats will tend to wait underneath the feeder for the fat balls. It's a tough one, unless your cats are used to it, which mine are, um, there's not much you can do, but I have known cats actually sit up with bird feeder with its mouth open, waiting for the baby to drop into the mouth. Um, it's a tricky one. Um, try and keep it, perhaps try and keep the feed down to um, perhaps of food that the cats are not likely to want. I mean, that's, that's the reason I don't put fat balls out because my black cat, eats the fat balls and then I don't get the birds on my feeders but it's a really really tough one the only, the only other thing is um could you have um I don't know if you can put a bell near the little hang some little bells from either a cat collar or actually have little bells on the actual bird feeder as well I don't know is the answer to that mine tend to leave them alone but as I said, um, I've got a bird feeder and of course I've got my hawk in the garden as well. So they're, they're so used to seeing birds around it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. scare them off, <laughs> shoot them away. We've got another question come in that um, Susan uh, thinks uh, she might have uh, nut hatches coming to the feeder in the last few weeks, but they could be, but could they be large chaffinches? Are they similar? Um, no, you you definitely know the difference. The little nuthatch um, has got a long, really long pointed beak, and they tend to climb up the fences as well. They can literally walk vertically up the side of the fence. Um, and if you tend chaff is chaff inches tend to be more woodland, so it's almost certainly going to have nuthatches. Get yourself a little bird ID book. And then you'll see they're actually quite different in the way they look. And both of them are on this PowerPoint, actually. So you could always have a copy of this PowerPoint and then you'll see between the two. But it's almost certainly going to be nut hatches rather than chaffinch. Thanks, Marina. Um, I think that's uh, all of okay. the questions. I had one question. Where, where does a, a beginner start to get into this? What, what would you say were the the first things to to do oh. um read lots of books watch lots of wildlife programs particularly Danvers life of birds and there's one that was also called flight um which was um narrated by the lovely david tennant um but also yourself a nice little start at the bottom. Don't try and don't go and buy yourself something so technical that you're just going to lose the will to live by reading it. Get yourself a little easy ID book. Go out, binoculars, and watch. And um, in lots of different habitats, like garden. Just sit in the garden one day with the binoculars. And um, with your little ID book and see what you can recognize. And even when you're out on your walks, take it out with you and see how many you can spot. And you'll be surprised at just how many different species you'll be able to spot um, that perhaps ordinarily you might not have looked at out on the walk. So a big, that's a beginner's guide. I mean, I think that's how I started. I, I, I think, you know, I sit on my balcony 
and I just look and watch and marvel at them. They're wonderful. Thank you so much, Marina. I think that brings Please us to a start. close this evening. Um, yeah, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed it. Um, uh, we will be, th thank you everyone for, for coming this evening. I uh, hope you found it interesting. Uh, I certainly did. We'll be sending around a short survey uh, to follow up after this. One of the questions to get your feedback, one of the questions we will have will be um, if you're interested in a second session from Marina around birds of prey. So look out for that. Um, if you do want to get in touch with us about presenting your particular passion or, or knowledge, please email us uh, on info at restless.co.uk. We'd love to hear from you. And keep your eyes peeled uh, on Restless community and our social media channels for the next webinar that's going to take place in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everyone, and have a lovely rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye now. Bye. Thank you, thank you everybody that attended. Bye. Bye. Bye.